Welcome back everyone to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill and by popular demand, I am absolutely delighted to speak to Patrick Armstrong again, CIO at Plumrini Wealth, one of the world's finest investment houses. So welcome, uh, Patrick. Good morning. Well, I really need your expertise at the moment. We've certainly been a lot happening since uh, over the last six months. We've had that mini banking crisis in March. We've got uh, hotter than expected inflation, both sides of the Atlantic. And now all the sort of central banks are syn synchronizingly tightening again and pushing interest rates up. So putting all that together, what's your sort of outlook for equities going forward? Um, I actually think equities are probably going to be positive in the second half of the year. Um, it's going to be a catch-up trade, a, a broadening of uh, the rally that you've really seen in the United States, especially that uh, 10 companies, 11 stocks, because Alphabet's there twice, are accounting for 13% of the 15% move in the S&P 500 year to date. So it, it has been incredibly narrow. You've got 409, 90 companies that are up 2%, and you've got 10 companies that are up 36%, basically. So um, a very narrow rally. Um, everyone's been scared to death entering this year about uh, a lot of the tail event risks you just uh, alluded to. And as the months have progressed, they started to dissipate. And I, I really think from where we are today, if you want to contrast that to where we were in the middle of October when markets um, basically hit their lows and we rallied since then, there's not been a lot of good news, mm. but there's not been much bad news at all. Everything that everyone was worried about hasn't been as bad as uh, the fears were. So um, European growth isn't strong. But we didn't fall into a major reception, a recession based on electricity prices or shortage of uh, energy. Um, the banking crisis that flared up pretty much disappeared pretty quickly. It, it's the recession that's always three months away just hasn't materialized yet. So um, the earnings per share outlook from consensus on October 15th for 12 months forward is actually Back then, it was higher than it is today. The 12-month uh, earnings forecast on consensus right now for the S&P 500 is a little bit lower than where we were in October, but the market's up 25% uh, since then. So it's really been multiple expansion and money that was on the sidelines because people were just scared to death of the bear market of 2022, seeing capital at risk. They've been slowly dragged back into the market as things haven't been good. Mm -hmm. But the terrible things that could have happened haven't happened. And uh, the economy has proved quite resilient as well. The consumption is strong. Employment backdrop still looks pretty strong as well. And the market's been able to handle the, the higher interest rates. Mm. Well, one thing which has sort of like been a head scratcher for a lot of cautious investors is that you, you have this sort of the wheels on the bus keep going round and round for the equity market. And that sort of like, you know, push the uh, the S&P 500 up to 20 times PE for this yeah. year anyway, at about 18 or so for, for next year. So not a super cheap level. So the wheels have carried on going up for the uh, go round for the equities. But the bond market, I mean, it's screaming recession. And likewise, the sort of forward leading indicators out in the States, the LEI is also showing sort of recession. How do we reconcile the bond market to the, you know, the um, the equity market? Because if, if they keep interest rates at higher for longer, something's going to break. Um, if they keep moving higher, I think something will break. If the Fed sits on their hands at this point, mm. I actually think we may just skirt a, a recession and not even fall into a recession in the United States. Um, but if you believe the Fed's dots and you've got another two hikes this year, I, I think that is going to put the U.S. into recession. I'm not sure they're going to do those two hikes. I think it's much easier for a Fed member to put a dot down than it is to hike at this point because you are starting to see some increased list in jobless, uh, list, joblessness, even though the employment situation is still pretty strong. Um, but the bond market, yeah, two tens are incredibly inverted. Um, the Fed fund futures are still uh, pricing cuts um, as we get into the end of this year and early next year, which, uh, yeah, we'll see mm. if those materialize. Um, and equity markets have really rallied a bit of a speculative fear around uh, the AI stocks, I suppose, in particular this year, that people didn't feel safe in equities. They didn't mm. feel safe in bonds. They've really gravitated to the mega cap uh, stocks that have weathered previous recessions. And I think the market's expecting secular growth out of these companies, where there probably is a lot more of a cyclical element to the earnings and the revenues of these mm. companies than there was historically. So I do think they are continue to be growth companies, but uh, the economic backdrop, the advertising backdrop is going to have an influence on Microsoft and Google and Meta's uh, earnings and uh, revenues going mm. forward.
So just on that sort of AI theme, et cetera, I didn't know you, you, you're going to more of the sort of the, uh, the sort of, you know, the, the less sort of like poster child. I mean, the, you don't, don't seem to own NVIDIA, which is now yeah. tw- at 25 times sales. So. Yeah, that's a, a multiple. It's hard for me to get my head around. So, um, yeah, in our broad portfolios, we don't own it, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we've got a 5G strategy where that's a, a component of it. So that's been one of our better performing uh, strategies this year. But it's, yeah, NVIDIA always seems to be, because it's got the, the highest processing power chips, um, whether it's cryptocurrency mining, whether it's the metaverse, um, whether it's AI, um, if there's a narrative to latch on to, NVIDIA is pretty much there. So you can see why everyone's attracted to wanting to own the best uh, yeah. the best processes for AI. Um, but that multiple, it is going to cause gravity on the stock at some point. It just can't keep uh, rallying um, until the revenues really do start to uh, double from here. And uh, it can happen. But uh, yeah, it's a bit expensive for me. I'm playing it more through the software. I own Microsoft. I own Apple. Mm. Yeah, you're just on Microsoft. You just recently bought it, haven't you? Sort of added yeah, that's sort of the portfolio. Uh, uh, yeah, we held that for most of last year. We sold it and we rebought it again in May. Um, and we're lagging the uh, MSCI World year to date. So our strategy is up 12% for the year. Well, the that's MSCI pretty good compared, you know, that's, that's not bad at all. So um, it's good to be in positive territory. Better than Crispy and Oddie's funds, that's for sure. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> we can always find a benchmark that you can beat. But uh, yeah, the MSCI World's up 15. Um, so I just was lagging behind. I didn't have enough tech. And uh, Microsoft's not a cheap company by any means, but it's mm. uh, reducing my tracking error. It's a stable company with good growth at a demanding multiple, but not a ridiculous multiple. So we've added that one recently. Um, thank God we added Adobe in March. Um, so that was one of the stocks that had lagged the tech rally in January and February. When we bought it, it was flat year to date. Why and did you up- get back into Adobe? Because it's sort of the world's leader in all things sort of e-commerce websites and sort of like uh, facilitating companies, doesn't yeah. it, to do... To do Generative uh- AI is the, the play on that. So it, it had really stable cash flows as well, a good growth. It was trading at 22 times forecast earnings when we bought mm-hmm. it. So it was a laggard that was cheap. Um, and... It's yeah, it's up to 35 times forecast earnings now, and um, yeah, it's not cheap anymore. But uh, it's been uh, thank God we bought that one because uh, yeah, it would be a little bit further behind the benchmark if we didn't. So it's yeah. a those are all plays on AI. They're all plays that we had before the real speculative uh, beaver around AI. So Adobe's a recent buy for us, but uh, mm-hmm. we've held Google, Microsoft in yeah, the just- past. We've held Apple. On, just on Google, and I know you still got that in the old alphabet in the portfolio, etc. Now, <clears throat> I remember watching on um, <clears throat> CNBC, there's a guy called, uh, you probably know uh, Brad Gerster from Altimeter, and he used to hold this one as a big position, but was a bit sort of like um, perplexed why they hadn't, Google this is, hadn't released their BARD a lot earlier, and now have lost the sort of like the front foot to Microsoft with chat GPT. What's your sort of latest on sort of like, you know, Alphabet? Because it's it's a bit of a battleground stock now, even though it's sort of supercharged. It's up, up 20 odd percent or so this year. Yeah, um, it's one that um, when it did release its uh, BARD, it, it underwhelmed, basically. It really sold off on that. And mm. uh, we stuck with it. They've spent hundreds of millions on different aspects of AI and uh, a bit of a... Oh, damp squib of a release on that one but uh, yeah. i think they are going to be competing with the leaders in this um ai is going to be a big thing it's uh, going to drive productivity it's going to create massive headwinds in some sectors massive tailwinds for other sectors that use it properly and um it's not trading at a ridiculous multiple either so um mm. it's in the high 20s now on a forecast earnings which for a dominant market position with good growth, um, again, nothing's cheap anymore if you're a mega cap tech, but uh, I think that's a reasonable multiple for it too. Yes. Yeah, so if you decided basically to sort of, you know, position the portfolio into regenerative AI, AI using the sort of the, the not the poster child, but the, still the big caps, you're going on that sort of like Goliath is going to yeah. win sort of syndrome. And ASML as well. Yeah. Um, NVIDIA is the purest play, but uh, they need ASML to... Uh, the big lithography yeah um it's uh, the leader there so um nvidia is the leader in the chips asml is mm-hmm. the leader in the equipment that makes those chips so um we've uh we're, we're participating in the rally there but uh it'd be nice to be in the leader there i suppose your to date basis but uh yeah the multiple is just a bit too rich for me 
<laughs> well, I guess there's sort of like, you know, about 10,000 stocks out in the state. So you, if you've just missed one, I mean, that's not a major issue. <laughs> Usually it's not a major issue, but it is a, just it's so narrow this year, the rally yeah. that uh, I think Met is up 120. NVIDIA yeah. must be 200 pretty much year to date. Yeah. What about to just turn into sort of China because that's obviously had sort of you know a reopening etc. And it's it's pushed up a lot of the European sort of luxury people, you know, sort of the likes of Hermes and um, LVMH. But equally, yep. sort of like you've got this problem on geopolitical risk potentially with the the US etc. What's your sort of latest on on the sustainability of the sort of opening in China big picture and how you view these luxury, you know, companies in, in Europe, the big sort of dominant ones. Yeah, that was one of our big themes coming into this year. And um, we still own Hermes. Um, we sold LVMH, I think it was at the end of April, um, just after earnings. Um, mm. It moved again, yeah. just like everything else from 20 times earnings to 30 times earnings. And I just yeah. thought everything was in the price there. It's an acquisitive company that became the biggest company in Europe pretty much. And uh, they will make another big acquisition. It may be dilutive. Um, so I just thought uh, I, I wanted to be out of that company given the, the run it had, a very mm. strong performer for us here to date when we did sell it. It's been pretty much flat since we did sell it. Well, it actually yeah. jumped up 5% right after we sold it, but it's uh, given that back now recently. Mm. And you can, so you're keeping um, Hermes, are you? Yeah, the, the idea, theme's yeah, still intact. China, you mentioned, is a, a driver for it, but it's just the consumer is incredibly resilient everywhere. Mm. Um, China's growth isn't incredibly strong, but it's probably going to grow above 5% this year. Where it is weak, it's in, in manufacturing. And that's not so much a China issue as it is the Western world's uh, issue as well, that uh, China is the manufacturer for the world still at this point. And... Europe and US not really falling into a meaningful recession, but they're not growing either. So that, that's hard for China to grow incredibly well. The reopening is definitely happening. Travel's happening. Um, there's still a lot of work, net wealth in China that is going to want to spend on luxury companies. So I do think that's going to continue to be a driver for revenue and earnings for these companies. It's just uh, we haven't our weight in it because of uh, the strong performance here to date and the higher multiples that come with that. Yeah. And then as we look towards the second half with that China theme, is that going to help the sort of the, the energy stocks? Because I know now you've got sort of like um, Shell in there and EOG. And I think yeah. it, you might be short EQT, but as I'm like, you know, just how, how that sort of like the energy and, and the super cycle, of, you know, commodities and stuff like that, is that going to help with um, your latest? Yeah. So our view is that the recession that everyone's sure of, the bond market's sure of, and everyone seems to be worried about may happen. Um, it's the Fed's going to, if they try to get too cute and keep hiking, central banks have always caused recessions. If you look historically, going back to the 80s, mm. almost every recession is caused by a Fed that just hiked too much towards the end of the cycle. So they are at risk of doing that. But if we don't fall into a recession, I think oil prices are going to remain pretty sticky at these levels. In the high 60s, low 70s, it's incredibly cash flow generative for all of these companies that are producing it. Um, Shell focusing again on uh, fossil fuels, not just on green. It's generating a lot of cash flow and increased its dividend. So I'm happy with the oil companies. They've mm. done nothing year to date. Um, if the recession is averted and there is a broadening of the rally, we think uh, energy companies will participate in that. Yeah. And EOG as well, I guess. The, yeah, it's the like, same thing. Yeah, it's the uh, LNG into the Europe, I guess, for the winter as well. <laughs> it's all all aspects of it. I think, uh, yeah, gas, LNG, oil, all of them. Uh, it's just incredibly profitable. Companies aren't spending yeah. much capex on exploring and developing for new reserves. They're just producing a lot of cash flow, paying down debt and buying back shares. And uh, yeah. as a shareholder, I think that's the, the best uh, position to be in. Yeah, there's some monster dividends, aren't there? Right yes, across are, that yeah. oil and gas space. But you know, and we shall sort of like, you know, it, right up there as well. Yeah. Um, now, um, just in, in terms of that sort of like, you know, the, the stronger economic performance and the potential of a recession, how long the, the Fed's going to keep interest rates. The sort of central issue seems to be wage growth in terms of that's the last piece in the jigsaw because that labor market doesn't seem to have cracked in the uk or in you in, you know in the us etc that and obviously wages when we look into 2024 this seems to be the big central question is, is when it comes to central the central banks to get basically a sustainable level of two percent into cpi 
how long is it going to take for the labour market to get in sync with a sort of like a 2% CPI rather than running at sort of a hot 5 or 6% wage growth, which yeah. I think is too high for the, for the, the central banks? It is. Um, so in the United States, wage growth is at a level where you, yeah, it's still inflationary, mm. but it's, I think the Fed needs inflation above 2% and governments need inflation above 2% because real economic growth is hard to come by. Nominal mm. growth just greases the wheels. It lets you run yeah. a deficit and manage your debt to GDP. So I don't think the Fed is going to mind inflation that's falling below four and not achieving two. Um, I think that's going to be a much more palatable outcome for the Fed members and probably for society as a whole. In the United Kingdom, I don't think the Bank of England has the same flexibility because inflation is much higher here. Wage growth does seem to be becoming a bit more entrenched. Um, you're seeing more troubles with uh, unions, things like that, strikes. Mm. Um, so my view is the Fed probably doesn't need to do anything else. Um, I think inflation will settle and that'll moderate wage demands. Um, in the United Kingdom, you've got a Bank of England, probably got to hike two more for sure, maybe three more times. And mm. uh, that will create some economic headwinds, um, probably disrupt the labor market to some extent, which should cool wages. But uh, yeah, different economies at different stages yeah. of where we are in the inflationary battle at this point. Yeah, and I guess there's probably also a difference in the flexibility of the labor force because most most corporates are hoarding, you know, seem to be hoarding uh, sort of their, their employees. But it, once they decide, the US decides to push the button, it's much easier to shed staff quickly in the States. Whereas I know in continental Europe and the UK, you've got yes. sort of six months, or whatever it is, to pay people off. Yeah, very, uh, yeah, much more flexibility for corporates in the United States. That's for yeah. sure. No, so, so if we are saying that the economy hopefully will have a soft landing or even a no landing, maybe, I noticed you've got sort of ArcelorMittal and um, Stellantis, the car manufacturers, and these 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 are large cap companies priced to destruction at the moment. I mean, they've got yeah. about five, five recessions priced into their share price. It, it is almost bizarre to see PEs that these companies are yeah. trading at, that uh, three times earnings, things like Crazy. that. Crazy. So, um, yeah, if you're not scared to death of a, a massive consumer recession, people are going to mm. buy cars. It's not an incredibly high margin business, but it is profitable business. They're also making money on financing. Mm. ArcelorMittal, again, it's producing positive EBITDA. It's got a lot of debt, but uh, with steel prices, margins where they are right now, anything that just maintains the status quo is great news for these companies. And that's the kind of market I'm expecting at this point. So there's obviously realistic and very plausible recession scenarios that can come from Fed mistakes or just uh, an exogenous shock uh, that mm -hmm. hits consumption. But people just are naturally wired to worry about the recession and get out of anything that's going to be hurt by it. But mm -hmm. I think with these multiples, you're going to be compensated for a yeah. pretty... Not a positive growth environment, but just something where the economy keeps tucking along. Um, mm. And these just stocks have such undemanding multiples. I'm happy to own them. Yeah. I mean, Warren Buffett says, you know, buy stocks uh, when, uh, when there's a big margin of safety and there's yeah. absolutely a colossal sort of like a one there. And I would say, actually, I'm going to be interested to hear your thoughts. There does seem to have been a rotation this year out of the sort of like your cyclicals and you know sort of like your your energy and people and, and, your, and your commodities overall this year into this super sort of like you know ai trade technology totally. trade that's the whole trade of this year yeah like i said it's 490 companies in the s p 500 have done mm. nothing year to date and 10 of them are up 35 percent. so um if you feel safe in something right now, it's going to be expensive. So if you're yeah. just say this is a company that's producing lots of cash, it's growing incredibly well, it's very expensive. So we talked about the luxury companies, we talked about the tech companies, the mega cap growth. Um, the rally has been so narrow. People are scared to death of the recession, scared to death of many things, and that's where they feel safe. And there's a massive amount of crowding in there. And uh, you've been markets a long time that when everyone's crowded into one type of position, yeah. It just generally doesn't end well. So I have no doubts about the quality of these companies. So that's something that mitigates a disaster scenario, but they are, they must be overowned at this point. Yeah, no, I agree. And on that, is it worth sort of considering at all sort of taking protect, given the VIX is at 14 or 15 or whatever it is, I mean, ridiculously low levels, getting sort of like, you know, buying sort of put options or are you, are you seeing that happening in the market at all? People, I mean, I suppose they've been, 
having to actually cover their shorts. But, uh, you know, when, when you look at that sort of level of the, the level of risk of any downside being in insurance terms so cheap compared to what it normally is. I mean, how yes. do you view it? It's cheap on the near month futures. The further out on the curve you go, though, so if you want to buy anything within the extended period, uh, right. the VIX is trading well above twenties by December futures. So um, mm. we are spot prices very low. Um, you can buy short term projection very inexpensively, but uh, if you do want to buy an extended hedge, it's not as cheap as the VIX may make it appear as well. So um, that's obviously going to be a drag, and. Um, yeah, with these kind of companies, I don't know if there's massive downside in them because they're great companies, yeah, yeah, no, no doubt no. about it. But they, yeah. my view is they just might be the dead money because they've had their rally and the rest of the market may be playing a bit of a catch up. So mm. buying puts, I think, will just add to a cost of a stock that may not right. be doing very much, in my opinion. Obviously, yeah, there, okay. are, there are risks with uh, such an incredible amount of money all flowing into the same kind of companies, though. Yeah. Well, just turn in sort of like into different sectors in the financials and the banks and 81 bonds, because I know you I know you did quite well, actually, out of that whole sort of like uh, manic craze, I think, anyway, with your uh, 81 bonds. But if you take, can you just take us through in your latest view on the sort of the banks? Because it's difficult to under, get my head around in mm. terms of you've got rising deposit rates, you've got an inverted yield curve. So logically, you would say their return on tangible book going forward is going to get crushed because they're buying higher than they can, but they can lend out. Yeah, uh, so I'm, there's some banks we own, some banks we're short right now. So I, in my portfolio, I own Citibank, I yeah. own BBVA in Europe. Yeah, I'm short uh, Bank of Nova Scotia in Canada. I'm worried mm. about property prices there. Um, the EQT you mentioned, we're not short the oil company. We're actually short the, the bank. Um, oh, the EQT see, bank. Okay. And I'm worried about private equity valuations as a whole. So we're short SoftBank, we're short EQT. Um, companies that have the ability to mark their assets to what they think they're worth rather than mm. what the market would probably price them at. Um, so yeah, banks are cheap like oil companies, but uh, some of the things in the interest rate margin that you alluded to, um, there's reasons why they're cheap as well. So um, I'm happy with Citibank. I'm happy with the big banks in the US that they're just getting trillions in deposits as people are moving away from smaller banks that uh, were obviously the epicenter of that mini banking crisis we went through. Um, but the well, just, on, just on just on Citibank, what what is it so cheap at that? You know, sort of like a optical on a price to book because it's been yeah, cheap for ages it's, and ages. It's like it's, nobody, people don't trust the balance sheet or something. They don't trust the balance sheet to some extent. Citibank, it hasn't been as bad as Credit Suisse was in terms of fines <laughs> and management mishaps and yeah. giving away a billion dollars to some account that they didn't mean to give it to. So they've made a lot of mistakes over the years as well. So I, I do think it should trade at a discount to mm. a JP Morgan or even a Bank of America. But I think that discount's too wide at this point because yeah, it does trade at a massive discount to the other mega cap banks in the United States. So um, it, it has some issues, but I think that's more than reflected in the multiples it's trading at. Yeah, okay. Now, just turn into sort of like another financial you own, which is more of a payments is, is PayPal. Now that yeah. was just, it was a dialing obviously of the lockdowns. It was over, a, I think it was about 300 bucks at one stage. And it's sort of like dripped down over the last two years to sub 70. And I think, uh, it, it came, what was really strange that I found anyway was that it came out with pretty it, it beat expectations yeah. in its Q1. It lifted it lifted guidance for 2023, and, it, and the shares got crushed by 15. percent Yeah, I think that was a, a bit harsh of a reaction myself because yeah, it's trading at an undemanding multiple. Its mm -hmm. revenue growth is really strong. Um, market just punished it because of an increasing amount of generic sales, non-branded PayPal sales, which they're never going to get the same kind of margin on, but it is real revenues. The yeah. earnings that are coming from it are already accounting for that margin. So um, it is a stock that uh, is just too cheap, in my opinion. Mm. It's growing, it's top line is doing well. Agreed. And the move towards generic isn't... Uh, great in terms of margin but it, it is all profitable business so um yeah that's what i'm very happy to own at these levels we bought it about a year ago to be honest and mm -hmm. pretty much today and we had a big gain on it right after we bought it, it gave it all back and we're probably back to where we bought it actually and uh, it's too cheap for me at these levels mm -hmm. is there still an active investor there it used to be Ell elliot partners i think it was um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's any active steps to yeah, unlock okay. value ongoing right now, but uh, 
it, there you go, Patrick. Step up to the plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's going to be somebody to unlock some value if it's not the current management. There's a yeah, it is too cheap given what its revenues are, and and it is a growth company still. Yeah, no, I would agree. Now, again, you know, just turning to an area that we've talked about before is agritech. And uh, I see you, you still own John Deere, which is, again, yep. another Warren Buffett favourite. And I think lots of people, very. We, we, if you have a look, actually, I mean, I know you do, but uh, like just investors, it, it's got a lot, it's got quite a big tech angle to this, hasn't it, with autonomous vehicles and uh, all this sort of stuff? It does. Um, it does seem to have a leading position there. Um, it's a, a stock that you could argue has a that kind of upside. It's got a defendable hmm. margin that's coming from that because its competitors can't compete with that. It's had an incredibly strong June. Um, hmm. it, it was a real laggard for us until uh, through May, but uh, it's it had a good bounce back for us in yeah. June. Um, it's a play, it's a cyclical, meaning it's trading at distress, distress multiples, but I think it is a very strong position, um, the dominant market position there. It's not a monopoly position by any means, but it is able to extract margin, um, whereas a lot of its competitors won't be able to. Mm. I was just looking at the actual debt on it. It does seem to be quite heavy. It's about three times EBITDA. When does it? When would it get a sort of situation you'd you'd sort of like double double take on a on a level of leverage? Mm, that's I think it with its cash flows, it's f- mm. fine. But uh, yeah, a cyclical indebted company it, it is something that if we did fall into a massive recession, it does have some things in its business model that mitigate that as well. That food prices probably aren't. Uh, Farmers are probably going to be pretty resilient in the next recession, I think. So you've seen food prices actually start to fall in inflation numbers, but grain prices for the last six weeks have started to move higher as well. And I think uh, grain prices where they are, farmers have a lot of ability to uh, deploy money in terms of farm equipment and things like that as well. So it's a cyclical, but it does have some nice attractive elements versus other industrials in a recession. Yeah, uh, as I, said, I think the, the technology angle is absolutely, I mean, they are leading in that area, Definitely, no doubt yeah. about it. And if people go onto their website, they can see all that. So it's worth having a look. Um, now, another one, which is really, really to the beneficiary, I guess, of trying to reopening, and certainly Macau, is Las Vegas Sands. All yeah, that's things a, sort of, yeah, go on. That's a pure play on that, basically. Okay. China had everyone locked down last year's gaming revenues were falling off a cliff, and gaming revenues are just surprising everyone to the upside. So, uh, People are traveling, Macau's reopening, and uh, gaming revenues are high, and that's a, a very strong indicator to uh, profitability for Las Vegas Sands. So th- that's almost a pure play on China reopening through a company that's not domiciled <clears throat> in China. What about the so one is domiciled in is Alibaba, which yeah. I think is a I don't know if it's an ADT, one of the you know ADR, sorry, in the states or whatever yeah. they, they they sort it out. But what's your sort of what's your view on Alibaba? Because there's a lot of geopolitical risk associated, I guess, from Beijing as well as from the yeah. US. Yeah, um, it's one that I could. We own Alibaba. It's cheap. It's growing. Um, but it's very hard to say what kind of discount you should put on it, given the geopolitical situation. That yeah. if uh, Blinken and Xi have a bad meeting today. I don't know how much downside will come from Alibaba if there's a, a good mm. meeting today. Maybe there's a, a jump in Alibaba, but it's a a position. It's just trading at 13 times earnings for mm. the growth it's generating. Um, Chinese consumers strong, um, but yeah, it's it's almost unquantifiable. It's a wild card that uh, the underlying business fundamentals. If it was a business that you could just value and it wouldn't have the issues of geopolitical risks mm. that come with it, it would probably be twice the market cap it is today. Yeah. And I think that's that's enough value for me that I'm enticed by it. But uh, okay. I wouldn't say that there's not downside to this stock either because uh, it is unquantifiable. Some of the bad scenarios mm. that could happen. Yeah, they did actually split some of their divisions, didn't they? Got the, yeah, the so it's an ongoing on... process where they'll break it up into six different divisions. They'll be IPOing mm. different versions of it or different uh, parts of the company as well. So that'll be a way to unlock some value potentially. But each one of those companies will come with their own uh, idiosyncratic risks. Um, without one company, it's less risky to the government and uh the Chinese government may let them prosper in one sixth pieces rather than Alibaba becoming a bit too big. And uh, Jack Ma, um, they've put out interesting now, statements. <laughs> yeah, I think the official statement is he's alive and well, something like that, which is yeah, it's uh, nice to know. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's one that's just, yeah, I don't. 
you get compensated by buying stocks that have clear risks with them. And I think this is one where you may see some multiple um, expansion as the, the company is broken up and faces less pressures from uh, the governments in China. Mm. I mean, another one stock that seems to go from strength to strength in the sort of tech area that is a geopolitical hedge, I guess, because it's, it's got there's so much sort of like cyber crime going off from Ukraine mm. and Russia and China and stuff is, is Fortinet, which I think is a best in class sort of like cybersecurity. Yeah, uh, that's uh, one play on it. It's a. Uh must be up 40 percent year to date i bet mm -hmm. something like that so yeah. it, it's benefiting from the tech rally um cyber security is going to be an area where private citizens governments and corporates are all going to have to continue to spend um so cyber crime and uh even from other mm -hmm. nations um there's going to be hacking and uh it is an area where there's very predictable cash flows um it's, it's not a stock that's cheap but it's a stock that's growing best in class as you say so it's a uh, one we're sticking with even though it's had a, a really strong run and it, it's one of those stocks that's not cheap anymore either yeah i guess they could have a sort of upgrade cycle in cyber defense and cyber security with ai because it, if nothing else is going to be sort of lot generative ai is going to you know you've got people who are going to be imposing in in you know different ways where yes where this, yeah <laughs> yes it's uh you know it creates some risks for them as well if they can't combat these kind of threats but yeah. uh, i think they're as well positioned as anyone to do those to do yeah. that good and then just and now turn into sort of like a really quite defensive core sector which did well last year and has been sort of like unfairly maybe sold off this year is healthcare and you've got yeah. biogen merck and where well, you've got the agri you've got soetis as well but certainly it's biogen and merck <laughs> Yeah, it's the healthcare sector must be pretty much flat year to date mm. in this rally. And if you are worried about a recession, um, mega cap tech have pretty resilient earnings and cash flows, but so does healthcare. And I, I think these stocks, um, yeah, the market's really rotated away from them. And mm. uh, we own Novo Nordisk as well, which yeah. is a, a company that's, it's, it's not done nothing year to date. It's up 20-ish percent. But uh, obesity is a big issue for the West. Um, China, there's, mm. I think Olympus is having incredible growth there as uh, mm. the attraction to being wafer thin in China looks like it's uh, really spurring sales. Um, so um, yeah, healthcare as a whole, predictable earnings, predictable predictable cash flow, non-cyclical earnings, all of that I think should demand a premium multiple to the market, but it, it's trading at a market multiple now. So um, I think it's growing faster than the market, probably more resilient cash flows than the market. And I think, yeah, I'm not sure why um, the market's really rotated away from healthcare, to be honest, because the underlying fundamentals look pretty good for a lot of these companies. Yeah. Just on, on Merck, it's got that sort of key drug, hasn't it? Cotruder or something, this big oncology franchise. Yeah, it can't, yeah. Cool. it's... Um, yeah, it's you could make a claim Roche is there too, but uh, Merck, it's one drug is by far and away the biggest uh, value in the company, but it does have a, a diverse, if it didn't have that drug, it would still be a big cap healthcare company with many streams of earnings and cash flows. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's stable, predictable, and uh, the oncology arm is uh, incredibly profitable. Mm. And, on, and on Biogen, obviously, there's got that big one on with the Alzheimer's, as yes. dementia. Yeah, it's one that, again, it's too cheap for me. Um, yeah. It's had some negative uh, news in Europe around that drug as well. Um, so it's not dead in the water, but it's not uh, having a massive tailwind where it's going to be sold widely in Europe at this point. So as more tests come in and mm. if it does prove effectiveness, there is significant upside. But uh it it does seem to be getting good traction in areas outside of Europe, but there's still more work for it to do in Europe. And that potentially, if you do get good results, um, would yeah. be upside for the stock. Yeah, I did one. I did look at it actually myself because it's it's got a market cap of 43 billion. Now, as you know, Pfizer just bought Seagate uh, mm. Pharma for 43 billion yeah. or 42 billion, it's exactly the same amount. And Biogen's got sales of 10 billion or near enough. And uh, and Seagate's got less than two billion, so it's sort of like yeah. five to one multiple there, sort of like you know undervalued. There probably should be some consolidation in uh, yeah. this sector where um, maybe you want to own potential targets than acquirers. So um, yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's again um, we've got a combination of port in our portfolio stocks mm -hmm. that have done incredibly well that are expensive, some stocks that haven't done the incredibly well that are cheap, and uh, we're sort of playing a middle ground of uh, trying yeah. to buy some cheap stocks with some upside but continuing to ride the winners as well 
Yeah. And what about um, Zoetis, which is a sort of like a, de- a best in class sort of developer of animal health products, isn't it? Which does sort of like pain relief and or, uh, everything. Anti- yeah. yeah everything. So livestock, antibiotics for cows, um, yeah. it does insurance for cats and dogs, um, all sorts of veterinary um, a- a- applications mm. as well. So uh, consumers are strong. People spending on their pets is a, a very strong and very profitable part of their business. But the whole agricultural theme is a, a driver for this company as well. So um, yeah, that's a company that I think uh, represents pretty good value and a lot of growth as well. Yeah, good. And now just turn into some ones you, you, you're short on. I did see you've got Neo and Rivian, the um, <laughs> which, I, which I could probably guess why you're short. But can you take us through your yeah, review it's... there? They've both been incredible shorts for us this year. Pretty painful (laughs) last two weeks, though, um, as the market rally has gone from just the mega cap tech. uh, Some of these more speculative tech and uh, EV companies have really had a rally into the the first couple of weeks of June. Hmm. I just think um, they're never going to get to the point where they produce a massive amount of profitability. They're both uh, Neo's got good revenues, great consumer share, but... uh, it's being valued as if it's going to dominate and extract incredibly high margin. And I think it's going to be such a competitive uh, space Mm. that uh, I don't think anyone's going to get there. I think uh, you'll have a bunch of companies being profitable, but uh, these companies are being priced as if they're all the disruptor that's going to dominate. So um, yeah, the the multiples they trade out are still eye-watering in my opinion, even after a pretty terrible year to date. Well, they haven't got, they're not positive multiples, are they? They're negative still. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Just when you come to manage risk, when you go short, how do you do that? Because obviously there's been instances whereby there's a huge short covering, you know, you get, uh, you know, on Reddit or people like Wall Street bets and this sort of stuff, who suddenly then you see the share price. How do you manage that sort of risk to make sure you don't get sort of zoomed out, you know? By- um so we have 30 stocks in our short portfolio mm. all the time. So it's a 3.3% position each. Um, if anything does start to go against us and it grows to a 5% weight, we'll yeah. either cut it or trim it back down. So, um, yeah, you can't manage risk perfectly because when you short something, there's always the yeah. risk with doing it. We Most of our clients who are buying our short strategy are pairing it with a long position as well or doing yeah, it through yeah. our long short strategy. So that creates some risk mitigation in itself that if something's going up massively, probably your longs are doing okay as well. But uh, our shorts had a terrible January. We lost 11%. Mm. And year to date, we're only down, I say only, we're only down 11% now. So for the... Yeah. The last uh, five months, we've actually, in a bull market, uh, done pretty well on our shorts because there have been some stocks that just have pretty terrible fundamentals that the markets have rotated away from. So um, you had a big speculative rally in kind of the stocks that you talked about in January, whereas meme stocks rallied again and all that ARK innovation type stocks had an incredible January. Um, The market has rallied a lot, but it's been more discerning and not just chasing everything that was growth. It's been chasing real mm. earnings, real cash flows um, in recent months. Yeah. That, so that's been good news for us. Yeah. And what's your sort of like um, the, the number one sort of shorts positions at the moment? Is it sort of like, you know, the, this banking area you talked about or the you um, know, CREs uh, or whatever? Property companies have a lot of debt. And mm. I think the higher interest rates have been reflected in property prices. So we've got yeah. 18% of our short portfolios in various yeah. property companies. So Venovia is residential in Germany, British land office space in the UK, Simon property in the US, shopping yeah. malls. All of them have very clear headwinds for me. So mm. British land has higher interest rates and people working from home. It's really hard to get rental growth in that kind of environment. Um, Simon properties with shopping malls. Um, everyone knows what's happened since COVID, even before COVID happened. It was a trend that was happening. People are shopping online, not going to malls. So um, I think that's an area that still has further downside and uh, mm. a big impact, lagged impact from the higher rates that uh, all the West is going through right now. Mm. And I guess if you've got any, there's a large corporate as a big debt balance somewhere, like, like your property guys, and they have to roll over that debt any time in the next 12 months, then they're really going to struggle, aren't they, I'm guessing? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, especially if that's paired with a, a recession if that does happen that's when mm. debt really starts to matter and uh, Venovi is one that uh, I'm not sure if the market appreciates how much debt they have but uh, mm. if you don't have positive property prices Venovia's balance sheet could become a big issue as they start to having to roll over debt yeah 
just finally, just one thing in terms of just a bit of education, really, for the mark for um, a lot of investors is how would how does a sort of like a house like Plurini put in AI into its sort of like strategy at the moment? Because obviously, with generative AI, you know, you, you, you sort of there's so much data created by the trading platforms, whether it's on on exchange or whether it's OTC or whatever. Is there a way of sort of like you know sort of assisting that whole sort of like you know you, you try and select stocks or you try and select areas that look interesting or actually even on the trading side um are you talking about how we utilize ai in yeah, our or just, oh, just yeah. generally yeah yeah so yeah we launched our strategy our global equity strategy is called the global ai strategy where we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to help us highlight stocks that offer yeah. good value good growth and momentum and it it's been a game changer for us in terms of stock selection. Mm -hmm. um, in 2017, I sold Apple. Um, it was called Facebook at the time and Google because they were expensive. And uh, everything that happened in 2022, I was worried about in 2017. And it was a terrible time to sell growth. And yeah. that's really why we put a better process in place. And we searched out uh, how we can use machine learning. Yeah. And everyone was using it for trading. Um, we couldn't yes. find a place where we could buy machine learning and AI to help us make investments because the market just gravitated to machine learning for pattern recognition, trading, yes. instant gratification. But there's whole series on thousands of companies where you get instant feedback from when analysts change buy, sell, hold, change earnings mm -hmm. estimates, the machines pick that up. If any insider buys a share or sells a share, the machines pick that up. And all it does is a bunch of regressions, time lagged, multivariate regressions and said, when these factors are improving, stocks tend to go up by this much over the next 12 months. So it's really been a game changer for us in selecting stocks um, over the last it's five and a half years we've been using it now. And uh, equities are just so much information. Um, it's pretty homogenous the way all these equities report. You get live feedback for the machines to learn from, from prices mm -hmm. every single day. We've tried to use it in bonds as well. Yeah, it just doesn't work because equities, the machines get a price you can trade at, whereas it's always attracted to bonds that have stale prices that you can't <laughs> trade at. So um, <laughs> it's uh, big data just lends itself to uh, equities and using machines to at least complement humans because uh, it's hard for humans to stay objective. Um, we all get emotional and it's hard for us to just take in the mm -hmm. overwhelming amount of information that's available. And that's where machines are very good. Yeah. And is that a sort of proprietary bit of sort of software you've got? Yeah, in it's, yeah. yeah, it's a combination of things. So it's proprietary and uh, we've got some licensed technologies as well that help us with the, the heavy lifting on the machine learning side of things. So, um, yeah, it's a, a, a hybrid uh, licensed as well as uh, proprietary is the way we use it. And uh, it's always it's not a complete black box because I see mm. every data input. I see what changes mm. from day to day and see what the machines are thinking about a stock today. Look at it historically. So it, it gives me comfort as well that I can get a good sense for what the machines are attracted to, why they're attracted to and what changed um, because we have we see all the inputs as well and see all the changes and recommendations. So um, I think many industries are going this way. Um, mm -hmm. Humans have a lot of ingenuity, but uh, anything you can do to help yourself and give yourself an edge, information advantages are really hard to come by nowadays, whereas yeah. processing wide amounts of information more effectively and more robustly than competitors. I think that's a sustainable advantage that we have right now. Mm. Particularly on a relative basis, if you've got sort of like similar companies operating in similar industries and you, and you see divergences, then that makes a lot of, you know, that can make a lot of difference. You, you know, you, machines are going to see that quickly. Yeah. Um, and machines, they've had an uncanny thing of picking up things that are happening in the world that they have yeah. no right to know about as well that mm. I, I've found that I, oh, when I see the machine changing a buy yeah. to an exit or a short, I can, it makes me think differently. And anything that makes you look at things from a different angle that makes you even think because mm. it's so easy just to get into a, yeah. a zone where you're just an autopilot. Um, that's been a, a real blessing for us as well. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, that's a great point. To sort of like the, the sort of final question is if investors want to sort of like, you know, put some money into the sort of that hybrid fund, the way you're mixing the sort of like the AI with the, um, with the, you know, the fundamentals analysis and stuff, how, how best to put money into uh, preliminary sort uh, of fund? If you go to plurimi.com, mm -hmm. there should be various uh, applications and uh, right. contact emails. So uh, anyone who's interested, uh, go to plurimi.com and uh, click on the links you'll get to uh, someone who'll be able to help you out.
Brilliant. Okay, well, that's a fan, another fantastic whistle through the markets and uh, some stocks with some great insights there into uh, to AI. So thanks for your time, Patrick. Thank and, you uh, very much. Look forward to seeing you again. in six months' time. Sounds good.